So for our session today, each panelist will share their reflections and experience supporting organizational resilience. And then we hope to have an open and active discussion. We have enjoyed many informative webinars thus far this week. And for this session, we want to invite all of you to ask questions and engage in a dialogue with the panelists and with each other so we can explore this, explore and discuss this theme of resilience and funding. I am pleased to introduce our panelists. We're so grateful to be joined by Matthew Cassetta, the Executive Director for the JRS Biodiversity Foundation. Tommy Sheridan, the Conservation Networks Mounted FITS, a contract program officer with the Organizational Effectiveness Program for the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. And Gemma Goodman, Head of Conservation Programs at Synchronicity Earth. I want to kindly remind our panelists, we do have the live interpretations, so please speak slowly to give our amazing interpreters time to translate. And with that, I want to hand it over to Matthew to kick us off. Oh, thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation. Um, just uh, for those that don't know JRS, we are a small foundation based in the U.S., and uh, we are a grant-making uh, foundation focused on um, enhancing and expanding scientific research and bioinformatics in Africa. Uh, previously, we had worked worldwide, but uh, for about eight or 10 years now, we've uh, we've decided to focus on Sub-Saharan Africa uh, simply because the biodiversity uh, is both incredibly rich and incredibly underdocumented. So um, in thinking about resilience, you know, we've heard so many great uh, presentations this week. So I just wanted to give a few examples from the JRS experience using the pandemic and then um, also pivoting to just a sort of a global challenge, if you will, that um, we face in the biodiversity aspect. So during the pandemic, um, our grant making obviously was interrupted <laughs> um, because uh, all of our grantees really couldn't leave. They couldn't go to field sites. They couldn't carry on uh, with implementation. So the first thing that I think um, we did well was we just had a lot of communications with them, a lot of uh, Zoom, a lot of email chats, just to check in with them and see what was the situation in their countries and um, really to reaffirm um, that we would be flexible. We liberalized um, uh, kind of the use of extensions for projects because we understood that they simply uh, couldn't be implemented. Um, for much of 2020 and 2021. So uh, as the pandemic wore on, however, we um, kind of came up with a little bit of an innovative strategy that we called lifeboat grants. Um, for biodiversity, protected areas are kind of front and central for um, biodiversity preservation. And we reached out to... Um, to several large organizations and did a, a little bit of a targeted RFP um, to gather proposals from those that were working in multiple protected areas. And what we did was we, um, we awarded very large, uh, larger grants than we would normally, um, up to about a half a million dollars to organizations that were working in multiple areas whose research um, a little more programs, if you will, if the research programs would have oh, simply stopped. Want... Is uh, maybe a question or? Keep going. Okay. Um, so basically, we um, we awarded very large uh, grants to these organizations to sustain the research. One uh, prominent example was the South African National Parks Agency, Sand Parks, um, which was really devastated. Uh, during the pandemic, because there was simply no tourism, there was no international travel, there were no there was no visitation to their parks, so they lost eighty percent of their revenue as soon as uh, the country shut down. So what this allowed us to do was really sustain research in um, at least a dozen countries uh, in some of the prominent parks in Africa, and um, it was you know I think one of the best 
ways that we could find um, through our grant making to really continue uh, to invest across Africa um, and meet a very urgent need very flexibly. So the second thing uh, that I wanted to bring up and give an example for um, is a little bit of an ongoing crisis. Not only in Africa, but throughout the world, there is a very limited pipeline of young scientists, particularly in the biodiversity realm. These are parataxonomists, ecologists, and others that are actively entering um, the stream, if you will, uh, through academics or research uh, to, to become professionals in their fields. Um, and I was recently talking to someone in Europe who actually said, no, this is also a problem in Europe, uh, that a lot of the senior ecologists, tax taxonomists, um, and researchers are retiring, and there's no one in their specialty behind them. So um, in Africa, the way we've tried to address this is, first of all, in all of our grants, uh, we fund between a dozen and two dozen a year. Um, we're requiring all of the grantees now to really have a strategy to bring in um, and, and actively recruit researchers or associates, um, could be at the university level or others, to really bring them into the stream. And, um, and we're really weighting that in our proposal selection. <clears throat> but um, we've also been partnering with several uh, NGOs and uh, Oxford University to really provide um, focus training to some of the, you know, um, let's say under-resourced stars, uh, young researchers who are really coming up, who are very committed, but who just simply can't get the lab experience or the, um, you know, the, the support to continue their activities. Um, so this has been a really important aspect of what we're doing, trying to meet um, really an urgent need in the field. Um, I, those are just a few examples of some of the ways that JRS is trying to build resilience in what we do. Um, and I will probably leave it there because I think there'll be other really exciting examples from my other colleagues on the panel. Thanks so much. Matthew, thank you for sharing that wonderful overview. It's already sparked a few questions. <laughs> in my mind, I'm sure others as well, but really amazing work. Thank you and the JRS team for all you, you're doing. Next, um, Tommy, can you share a bit about uh, WCN's approach to building organizational resilience? Sure, thank you so much, Kate, and thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, I'm gonna share my screen just very briefly. Uh, so it should be this one. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. yes. All right, cool. So I work for a group called WCN, the Wildlife Conservation Network. We're a pretty small group based in San Francisco, uh, about 25 to 30 staff. Uh, and our goal is to support conservationists uh, that are protecting wildlife to help people coexist with wildlife. Um, and at WCN, very quickly, we have three different strategies, which I think are important for donors and conservationists to understand that there's many different approaches of how to get money out and support to conservationists around the world. And the first one that I help manage is our partner network, uh, which is designed to try to promote organizations that are community based and locally led around the world that are focused on endangered species and community based conservation. But they might not have a platform for funding here in the USA, where most of the individual philanthropy still comes from at the moment. And so what we do at WCN is we have a partner network of organizations that we fiscally sponsor uh, so that they can get fundraising in the USA. And we try to constantly promote them so that donors here can decide where they want to put their donations. And we guarantee that 100% of those donations go to the designated partner. And so I think that's a great model. And we also try to provide any training or capacity building that they request or feel they need to improve the management of their own NGO. So that's the partner network. And then secondly, we have a, a strategy called the wildlife funds, which is recognizing that sometimes there 
it takes many, many different organizations to address a threat to different species or landscapes. And so the goal of the wildlife funds is to just get money as efficiently as possible out to different projects around the world uh, for wildlife conservation. And so with this, it's a bit more typical of like a foundation type relationship, but the wildlife funds embedded in their in their model, as well as the partner network, is to provide as flexible of funding as possible and as long term. So all of our grantees or partners, there's uh, many discussions about how they can use this funding flexibly, whether they need to put it towards their own salaries or operations or, you know, truck insurance is something that most grants from a a government source might not always be flexible in supporting. Um, and so that's a goal of ours at WCM because most of our funding luckily comes from private individuals. So we can be a bit more flexible on that. Uh, and the last strategy that we do is that, like Matthew was saying, we recognize that it takes a lot of good people to get involved in conservation early on in their career to manage these organizations that are helping wildlife coexist with people. And so we also have a scholarship program for people pursuing their masters or PhDs in, in conservation related fields. Um, and also a career program, which is intended to invest in conservation is very early on in their career between two to 10 years uh, with, that might want flexible funding for their salary or to pursue a certain project uh, that they often don't get that level of trust based philanthropy or flexible funding early on in their career. And we're trying to change that a bit where we can demonstrate trust with them and help them manage their budgets and things like that uh, early on so that they can then demonstrate that they're worth worthy of being invested in further uh, with larger projects. And so the, these are WCN's three different models. And one example I'll show that Kate asked us to focus on today is uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we launched a wildlife fund called the Emergency Relief Fund. Um, which was designed to, I'll stop checking now so we can see each other again. Uh, it was designed to respond to the pandemic threats, uh, but in a way that was very uh, quick and reliable and uh, flexible as well in what it could support. Uh, and so we designed a, a application process that was only about three pages. Um, and within that, it was about probably five different questions. It was about what is your threat you're trying to address? Uh, what is the solution that you guys are trying to enact to address that threat? And what is your annual budget and uh, your staff makeup pretty much? Um, and so those I think are some of the core things that pretty much uh, every organization that's funding conservation is trying to understand uh, is what is a community-based conservation organization's goals and what do they, how much money do they need to address those goals? Uh, and I think that the emergency relief fund was very successful uh, because we also were not trying to hold on to the funds for too long. It was a two week turnaround time. So we were trying to get funds out the door as quickly as possible, as soon as people applied for them. Um, and long-term we didn't have goals for it to just have a reserve or an endowment to last forever. It was intended to just quickly get the funds to where it was needed most. And if it was successful, which it seemed to be, uh, we got out about a million dollars in the first two years of the pandemic. Uh, then the goal was to demonstrate to donors that it was having an impact and try to fundraise more with that impact. Um, and so I think it's been a successful model. Uh, right now it's kind of dying out as the pandemic resides. And so what we're doing is adjusting it to be not just COVID-19 emergency related, uh, but any type of emergency that's a short-term crisis such as natural disasters or insecurity, um, many different short-term threats that conservation has experienced. Uh, so that's our emergency relief fund, but we have many other wildlife funds that are longer term in focus. Um, and then I think the last thing I'll try to pitch or ask from the audience to today is recommendations that you guys might have about how donor organizations can improve on the way we support community-based NGOs around the world. Um, because I think one thing we're trying to do at WCN and hopefully with a cohort of other funders as well is to create what we're viewing as like a common application for conservation NGOs. Um, because many of you probably have seen many different uh, prompts or questions from different funding bodies, and it takes a great deal of conservationist time to complete all these applications. 
And in my opinion, I think there's probably a subset of about four or five questions that we're all trying to get at, at the core of funding uh, that we could be more flexible on uh, and try to be more coordinated on so that conservationists are wasting less time customizing each grant application for different NGOs or funders. Um, so yeah, that's also the Wildlife Conservation Network and I hope to hear more from, yeah, and absolutely, somebody said translating the application. I think that's a huge issue right now in conservation. So uh, trying to do that would be a lot easier if we were all on the same page. Um, but yeah, that's us. And I look forward to hearing from you guys how we can all improve better as well. Thanks, Kate. Tommy, really exciting overview. Thank you. And I should know the answer to this, but for the emergency relief funds, I remember for the scholarships, I think it was to, to active scholarship recipients for, um, was the emergency relief fund for current or existing WCN partners. Yeah, so there was a subset just for our scholarship program, folks to receive some. Uh, but yes, the emergency relief fund was not just for WCM partners, uh, but any grantee or organization that we're familiar with in our network. Oh, amazing. Uh, so if anybody feels that they are a fit, they can feel free to share their email in the chat or reach out to me. My email is tommy at wildnet.org. I'll share it in the chat. Um, we're still open to hearing from other organizations that we might not have known before, too. Thank you, Tommy. And you're queuing us up already with a great discussion question. But before the open discussion, we're excited to go over to Kama to share a bit about um, Packard's approach to organizational effectiveness. And Kama is joining at 5 a.m. her time. So thank <laughs> you very much for waking up and being here with us. Thank you. Well, it just happens to be I'm traveling. My computer actually says 6 a.m., so it's not so bad because that's my my normal time. Um, well, thank you for uh, inviting me to to um, this panel, and I'm it's great to hear from the other panelists, and I'm looking forward to questions. I am a contract program officer with the Packard Foundation's Organizational Effectiveness Team, and the David and Lucille Packard Foundation is a U.S.-based foundation working to protect and restore our natural world, build just societies and invest in family and communities around the world or in, in various geographies around the world. And for uh, nearly 40 years, the foundation has had a dedicated program to strengthen uh, and invest in strengthen leaders and organizations in order to drive positive change through our projects. And right now the foundation is carrying that out through what we call our organizational effectiveness program. That's in flux with a bunch of um, our strategic planning, which is in process, and it's morphing into what we're, we're anticipating will be called the Civil Society and Leadership Program. The a few underlying beliefs that drive our work is that supporting and connecting leaders is a critical ingredient to achieving systemic change. So we believe that Investing in people is at the heart of that change. We believe that progress in a field requires strong relationships and collaboration across organizations. So we invest in the strength of networks and the ecosystems in which they work. We believe that different support is needed at different moments. I think the other two panelists pointing out the, the COVID response type of programs is a great example, but that organizational development and leadership needs evolve and change as the world faces new challenges and crises. And uh, we believe our grantees need access to responsive support in that, that response to that, those changes and those challenges. And that last, we believe that leaders and organizations need to be able to operate legally and safely in order to achieve their goals. And I think a lot of us have experienced that the space for civil society is shrinking around the world. And yet this strong civil society is a necessary condition to achieve and maintain change. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the specifics behind our work. And again, with the caveat that this is morphing slightly as we go through our strategy process over the next um, six months or so. So our organizational effectiveness team works hand in hand with our program. So I think some on this call might be familiar with the Packard Foundation Conservation and Science Program. That's where our oceans, uh, fisheries, 
forest climate programs all live. That's where I, I work specifically with that team, but we have different team members working with our gender program, our programs in um, reproductive health and children and families and, and the other programs across the foundation. And we work directly with our program colleagues to combine a suite of tools that are program or geographic specific and designed to support the org individual organizations and leaders, as well as the ecosystem in which they work to help achieve the field level impact and build enduring capacity that the foundation is looking to achieve through its goals. Anna? So this, yeah. Can you slow down just a little bit for our interview? Yeah. Thank you. Jane, sorry about that. I do tend to talk quickly, fast. So then this work could look different depending on the different places in which we work, but I'll give a quick rundown of those different tools and sort of our, I guess, the, the, the toolbox that we, we deploy in different places. So first we have a series of system level um, offerings, both capacity and leadership offerings that are addressed, designed to address the core system level needs that could cut across sectors. So these include our leadership cohorts. They are, we have these to both support emerging leaders as well as established leaders. These include, just as examples, we have the Bacall Leadership Program in Indonesia and the Spindrift Leadership Program in China, one of which is designed to support Leaders, leaders over the long term. One is more about supporting le entrepreneurial leaders in the ocean space. We have a number of resource hubs. These actually, uh, some of these were long-term established resource hubs, and some of them actually grew out of COVID response programs. But these are designed as flexible, responsive platforms that offer workshops and trainings, on-call consultants, small grants, and, and coaching on a range of leadership and management topics. We have these in several places in which we work, but a couple examples are the Resilience Initiative in the US and Espacio de Resiliencia in Mexico. Then we have uh, what we call multi-year capacity support programs. And these programs support multi-year grants that um, our partner recipients can receive the uh, commitment for a multi-year grant. That is the work that, that they're, they hope to do under the grant is guided by a capacity development work plan and a direct coach, direct coaching support. And really these are designed to help an organization mature and evolve over time, giving them time, you know, several years to, to implement changes. And a couple of examples here are the Leaders Trust Program in the US and the Yapika Multi-Year Program in Indonesia. And Lorna, it is the Packard, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I have this. It's sort of hard to both see you guys, read, comment. So if I miss anything, ping me again. And then the last one we have in this series of sort of the, the overarching systems level uh, pieces are issue specific cohorts and programs, and these are often in response to our programs in a certain program in a certain field or geography, and they're around specific issues such as security or justice and equity. And a couple examples of these include in Mexico, we've supported the design and launch of the Protecting People, Protecting Nature program, which is a holistic program designed to offer both proactive and responsive security support to frontline environmental defenders. And in the US, we have, as an example, the Marine and Markets Equity Cohort, which is a multi-year program that includes a mix of virtual and in-person trainings, ongoing cohort support, coaching, as well as targeted grants to support organizations' participation and work throughout the program. And in addition to the system level offerings, the Organizational Effectiveness Program gives direct grants to our current grantee partners to support existing needs and capacity development needs. So these targeted grants, which I think we give you know, I actually was before this, but ran out of time because I didn't get up in time, was going to check how many grants we gave this year, but we give um, probably hundreds of individual grants each year to our existing grantee partners that work through, through our programs to, that are designed by the partners with support from us to address un, 
an organizational capacity need or goal. So these can be strategic planning support, succession planning, fundraising or communications campaign, direct coaching, wellness offerings, um, sort of whatever the, the grantee partner determines they need. And they're usually one year, one time grants. And then just to wrap up, I wanted to throw out two sort of fundamental beliefs that kind of underpin a lot of our work. And first is that for all of our capacity and leadership investments, when we talk about the resource hubs or the, the cohorts, we, prior, we always prioritize selecting local organizations as the intermediaries. We believe that all of our programming is an investment in local capacity and that these organizations then these local intermediary organizations can not only support our partners, but also the broader civil society in a country. And that strong, durable civil society requires organizations that are rooted in the context and are led by local leadership. And that generally the most dominant nonprofit and business management best practices come from the US and Europe. So a key part of our through our work when we when we do develop these in-country programs is starting with research on how individuals and organizations in that place define strong and effective organizations. And then the results of that research allow us to better partner with our local grantees and inform how we and other donors can best support and invest in strong supporting strong organizations in the places where we work. So that is with that, I'll wrap up. A lot there, Kama. Thank you so much. Um, I will save save questions until after, but yes, we'll make sure to post the links in the chat. Thank you, Tommy. Look at this teamwork happening. Um, there are a lot of great resources on all of the organizational websites. Um, Gemma, will you please uh, share Synchronicity Earth's experience and uh, lessons learned? Thank you so much. Um, thanks so much for inviting me today and um, yeah, for all of you being here. I'm sure a lot of what I might say may have already been touched upon by others, so thanks for making my job very easy. <laughs> um, so for those that don't know, Synchronicity Earth is a small charitable foundation with a focus on supporting overlooked and underfunded issues. We're primarily a re-granting organisation, enabling funding to get down to the ground level with what we think is a holistic model of support. Our support funds six conservation programs currently and almost 90 different grantees or partner organizations as we call them, with a focus on funding grassroots, local and national organizations, and sometimes individuals in some of the world's most biodiverse regions. We believe this is where we can have the most impact and where the majority of effort is required for conservation effectiveness to improve. We have been slowly reflecting and refining our model of giving for over 10 years now, um, working towards building really long term solid relationships and reputations. Increasingly, we've been focusing on providing core support and longer term grants. And recently, we underwent a great big survey of all of our partner organizations and what it was they really wanted from us and out at the top was long-term support and operational core support not size of grants which was kind of fourth down I think um, so that was quite an interesting exercise to go through so I do believe there are lots of great ways to fund and there is no one size fits all um, but from our perspective, in order to build resilience, you really need to have flexibility, understanding and relationships at the core, fund core and operational costs so you can have a stable operational base, be adaptable in terms of your reporting requirements um, and in general, and also learn, reflect and listen. It's no coincidence that many of these things are also key principles of trust-based philanthropy, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, while we sit somewhere on the continuum between recognizing the need to measure impact and ensure accountability um, to working with people based just on relationships and trust, we also recognize that the compliance to these often Western established criteria are not necessarily the best use of time or efforts in often stretched civil society groups. Um, like Tommy has highlighted during the COVID pandemic, 
we too needed to redirect funding. Some of our partner organizations were doing things like giving out masks, educating people on the risks and how to protect themselves, and even um, funding things like internet access within individuals' homes or paying for people's salaries when they actually couldn't work anymore. Um, and I think that a lot of different trusts and foundations have been following this model and becoming more adaptable, which I think offers a lot of hope. Um, however, lots of organizations will continue to be impacted by things like natural disasters and civil conflict as the twin crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss continues. And I think it's important that the donor community finds a way of supporting these groups. And we've heard about these emergency funds from several people here today. Um, but is there also a way to just build this into our giving so that it's a regular part of grant making, for example, being totally flexible on a small amount of the money being deployed so that we can build some of that resilience to groups? Um, the other point I wanted to talk about was just the kind of power dynamics that still exists between um, donors and gratis often, and also the fact that um, it is still the case that Western conservation organisations or Western-led groups often get the majority of funding. And that the groups on the ground can often struggle to comply with some of the international regulations or reporting requirements and therefore obtain the funding that they need to hold on to the most excellent staff that they often have. Um, so I think you will all agree that a key dimension of resilience um, is really diversity, a diversity of approaches, scale, beliefs, cultures, and everything else. So I guess my call to action would be that there isn't one size fits all in terms of funding or support, but I think the human relationships being at the center of that is really important and allowing for that diversity to be reflected in the way that we give including things like different languages and accesses, but also different types of reporting. Is it through video? Is it verbally? Is it on paper? Um, is all really central to solving um, the biodiversity crisis. And finally, I think um, we also need to look at how we support organizations in terms of their ability to realize their missions and objectives. Um, and helping them to do that and therefore helping all of us to achieve the desired biodiversity impacts. And that's all I really wanted to say. So thank you very much for giving me the floor and I'll hand it back. Wow, amazing. Thank, thank all of our panelists for sharing very brief overviews of the huge work that they are all doing in this space. So round of applause um, for all of you for sharing for sharing that. Um, we've had some questions in the chat, uh, which Tommy has answered, I believe. But um, does anyone have a question for our panelists? If not, I think we can start with the great question Tommy keyed up for us. But I don't want to just take over. So Tommy had asked all of you, our partners on the ground, what do you think, what do you want donor organizations to improve on when supporting community-based organizations internationally? Yeah. Yes, Kat. Hi, Tionde, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, how are you? <clears throat> Great. Yeah, I, I, have, I, I have followed the, the panelists keenly and then I don't have a, such a specific question for them, but uh, it's actually almost like uh, we are having the same experience in terms of how to adjust in uh, during pandemic. Like uh, uh, in our case in South Sudan uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic, you know we had uh, issues of uh, what what don't I say change of uh, change of uh, focus. Uh, where you find that uh, donors that have been uh, supporting some uh, uh, activities outside, uh, like, like those organizations that were focusing on other activities apart from uh, 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 AIDS, will have to change their focus on uh, aid and uh, provision of things to do with the uh, non-food item, food, and sometimes medicine. Then uh, it narrow, you know, the the it narrow uh, our uh, donor support toward conservation initiative. 
But uh, in then uh, what we did as an organization with our ongoing, on, ongoing projects, we actually open uh, like we, uh, we used to have uh, like with projects like uh, chickens and, and uh, vegetable growing in uh, our field site, which we actually encourage our but our, our beneficiaries to have uh, open up market in in, in Juba, which in turn uh, also bring them uh, you know uh, income and that also give them again to to continue in uh, sustaining the projects that we were actually working on. Uh, that is actually in relation on how we sustain uh, during pandemic. That is what we actually did here. Can you please remind the group the name of your organization? It's Peace and Development Collaborative Organization uh, in Juba, South Sudan. Wonderful. Yeah, and our field location is in, in the Badingiro National Park which is actually, I uh, think, the, the second largest, which is hosting the largest, the largest migration of uh, animal in, in Africa. Oh. And uh, where we are actually, you know, having our activities with the wildlife preservation when they were still here in, in, the, in, in South Sudan, we are trying to, you know, uh, create an awareness and change of, uh, change of focus in terms of livelihood where people were using, you know, the wildlife as their source of income and also source of food, uh, where they abandon agriculture. And then when we come in with the support from a wildlife conservation society, then we try to uh, orient them on how they can uh, actually do better and conserve the, the wild species in the, instead of destroying the forest and killing the animal. Then instead they have to use the environment constructively for livelihood and preserving also the, 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 the wildlife uh, that are used for migration, which actually in future, when uh, the health stage is said is developed, will bring actually income to the country. Fantastic. You all are doing amazing work in a challenging location and situation. So thank you for, for sharing. Thank you. Kama, please. Yeah, I was just going to, I saw Martha's comment on the um, challenges of getting overhead costs. And so kind of two answers to this. First, the Packard Foundation was part of an initiative with uh, several other foundations on looking at the tr at true costs. It was called the True Cost Project, which was about setting, looking at what it really does take to run programs. What is this whole indirect bucket? Should there be a certain... Um, for, for indirect costs, I think it's coming out of that. Some of the foundations said we'll, we'll fund 35% overhead. You know, they, they're just the acknowledgement that there are real costs for running programs that aren't necessarily the quote unquote program costs. Um, I also will say from our experience in the OE program, when we work with our uh, larger sort of more formalized nonprofits, those that have development staff or grant writers, they're really good at asking for staff time and what you would consider overhead costs. And a lot of times the smaller, maybe it could be local or national organizations, they don't make that ask. And so a lot of times we'll go back to those partners and say, we're adding in an additional five or $10,000 onto, onto the top of your grant just because we recognize that there is not enough funding in here for your staff or your rent or your whatever it's going to take to do the work that you've laid out in this, this proposal. So I would encourage, I know it's a hard thing, but I would encourage everyone to make the ask. And, and I know not all foundations, some still have that 10 or 15% cap, but I do think there's a change coming in the philanthropic world around that. Thank you, Kama. And that kind of goes back to the points most of our panelists made about having strong relationships between partners, grantees, and the, the donor community. So you can ensure you have a solid relationship where you might feel more comfortable. It's trust-based, right? Opening up about real needs and they can understand the work being done. So that's wonderful to hear that a change may be coming because it's, it's much needed. I'm going to look through the chat because I'm sorry I'm not up to date. Could I come in with one um, voice of support for uh, something that uh, uh, the colleague um, 
the former panelists mentioned, flexibility is really key. I think even beyond, you know, the pandemic, um, uh, you know, related uh, changes that were rapid and consumed everyone. Um, since then, we've had real dislocations in terms of pricing, particularly uh, for transport and fuel. And uh, we've had several grantees uh, come to us in dialogue and have to revise upwards their original bu budget estimates because the price of fuel tripled in several countries um, mm -hmm. almost overnight since since February. So, um, you know, I think I think flexibility is really key. And of course, it all hinges on good communications, um, trust and partnership, you know, but it but it's so key, you know, we wouldn't want to see a project um, fall or really have to reduce its activities to a third simply because of um, a rapid price rise, um, currency depreciation, all of these other things that really affect the day to day. Thank you, Matthew. Hugely important. Can I just add on to that as well? I think one of the things when you're thinking about um, core funding for staff salaries in particular, taking into account not only those kind of operational costs there, but also just the cost of living inflation that's happening across many regions of the world, and that actually you're not asking people to take a cut in their lifestyles and um, yeah, as we if we keep funding at the same levels that we were doing so even a year ago, they're actually having to take a cut in the way that they live. So I think that's re another really important thing to remember. Yeah, definitely. Everything is so dynamic. Tommy? I was just going to reply to the comment from Anne Alexander. I liked it a lot. Uh, she said there's a challenge for organizations moving up in the funding chain, which I completely agree, Anne. And I think one thing we could do better as funding organizations is transparency about where donations are coming from so that there's not always this. Uh, at the moment, there's a lot of middlemen in conservation funding or international philanthropy. And I think that it needs to be removed a lot for some more efficiency. And one way to do that is by tra sharing more uh, transparency about where donations are coming from. So at WCM with our partner network, every donation that comes in allocated for our partners, we share exactly who the donor was and how much they gave and how they can contact that individual if they would like. Because <clears throat> they're not WCN's donors, they're our partner's donors. And so I think that's really important for uh, philanthrop philanthropic organizations to try to move towards moving forward uh, because in the future hopefully our partners can stand on their own and sustain their own donations and relationships directly with donors without me being involved at all. So I hope that that's a trend we see more in the philanthropic space. Thank you for uh, uh, elaborating on that. I can agree with you as well. Lorna, please. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit um, on the chat. Um, I think it's often misunderstood or not appreciated that running a, a local organization is extremely difficult in terms of being effective, in terms of being able to maintain a funding stream, a dedicated and uh, resilient staff who are well-trained and committed and whom you are able to offer realistic employment over a period of time. Um, I spend much of my time juggling, I think, um, these kind of issues. And um, when you receive, you know, when you have a, a funding application in and you are requested to phase out certain uh, um, members of staff over a period of time because it doesn't fit with all the activities in that year. It becomes totally unrealistic, unrealistic and very stressful, in fact. Um, and I, I feel that there's sometimes not a lot of compassion or real understanding of the challenges that we um, go through in, in maintaining our very real um, valuable organizations, you know, and, and <clears throat> delivering the work that we do. 
um, I think perhaps many of the larger donors are somewhat removed um, from the reality on the ground and I don't know how we solve that apart from perhaps getting them here <laughs> to see how it is. Um, but I think there does need to be flexibility and understanding and a real um, wish for understanding, um, you know, that, so that we're not being suspected the whole time of perhaps misbudgeting or you know trying to make money or whatever because there's nothing further from the truth really thank you thank you Lorna and apologies can, I, I'm not sure which which organization you're you're with myself yes I'm I'm with um, a organization called Mwambao in Tanzania wonderful We're based in Zanzibar coastal uh, Thank you. Conservation. Amazing. Anne? Hi, yes, I, I just uh, um, wanted to react quickly to uh, what she said, because I think this is indeed, it, it goes back to what you mentioned before about building the trust with the organizations that you're supporting. Um, and I think this is very much uh, a philosophy that we also work with and that I think helps organizations in the field a lot if you indeed express compassion, but not just that compassion, it's, it's having uh, faith in their expertise and in their uh, proposal. What we see a lot is that um, we spend a lot of time in selecting our, the, the projects um, to support and, uh, but once we make that decision, we also really give them a lot of trust and a lot of freedom because we believe that these projects, okay, if we decide to support them, we believe in their expertise. This is a, this is a vouch of, of trust in, in a way. And um, they are on the ground, so they know best how they need to adapt. And indeed, if fuel prices go up a lot, uh, we, we, you need to adapt. And if, if uh, yeah, especially if you've been in the field yourself, you know that political situations change, social things, uh, that, that you need to adapt to uh, your program, to the context that is there. So not everything is, is um, uh, you're not able to plan everything ahead and therefore budget for everything that comes your way. Uh, and I think uh, whenever we encounter these projects, having to make a move or having to readjust the budget, uh, it, they are they feel greatly supported if we, um, you know, if we, if we let them know that we trust them to make the right decision in that sense, budget-wise. Just wanted to make that point. Thank you. That's real. It's really inspiring and important to hear that many of the donors are trying you know focusing on on this trust-based um, philanthropy again these partners on, on the ground are the ones that know the reality and personally i think they should be trusted to um, implement their projects as they see fit there is the chat is very active um, so many great things i'm sorry i'm having trouble keeping up but i wanted to Go back to um, Lucia's comment. There are many less attractive expenditures, buying vehicles, et cetera. Also, innovation can sometimes be not welcomed or not well understood and perceived as a risky investment by a donor. I really appreciate this comment. Um, if I can ask our maybe our panelists or just the group, I think it's really important to have this space for innovation. Um, I know it's a common discussion around failure, fear of failure, all of that. How do um, how can our grantees include space for innovation um, in their proposals, and, and what are donors' responses to that? I'm happy to jump in, and I'll, I'll answer. Actually, I want to respond very quickly, just even though it's kind of it's a could be a small it's a smaller concept in this larger innovation question, but around um, automobiles and, and equipment. So we recently supported uh, one of our grantees through an organizational effectiveness program buying or putting some of the funding towards buying a vehicle, which was fundamental to their work. There's a lot of uh, issues around that from the U.S. standpoint when we're working with 
grantees overseas, a lot of IRS rules. So this grantee now has to report to us on that vehicle use or that hard equipment cost for five years under IRS rules. So just so everyone is aware that at least for U.S. foundations, it gets very tricky and a lot of burden then lies with the, the nonprofits that are receiving the funds if we're buying things like vehicles and other um, capital expense are considered capital expenditures. So um, we're often looking for other ways around that versus trying to put our funding into to those sort of capital expenditures. But then on the innovation piece, and this is not the best answer by any means, because I think different organizations, different foundations are open to innovation in different ways. But I do think I, I shared a, a link in the chat to a, a group called Odessa, which has a woman, um, Dagan Ali, who's been doing quite a lot in the U.S. talking to foundations about decolonization of philanthropy and aid and how do we make grant making more proximate. And one of her biggest points is that there is a lot, there's a problem of visibility for a lot of the smaller organizations and getting the get it being visible to the larger organization. So I think we can, there's all kinds of um, ways that we can brainstorm how we, and I think um, Tommy's work on the, the the work that they're doing and some of the, the clearinghouse organizations, websites, spotlighting different groups and other things like that are a way, but I think as donors, we need to do a better job of seeking out the smaller local non nonprofits, maybe community-based or or even national, because I think it's easy for us to fall into the working with the same old folks in different places around the world, but we really need to do the legwork of finding those, those smaller nonprofits. And then for me, once we find folks and we build those relationships, the innovation is not an issue, at least as you know, from my standpoint in a lot of the programs that I do. And we're happy to support innovation, but it's more about how we we build those initial relationships and seek out those partners. Thank you, Kama. Um, John Fellows pointed out in the chat, oh, sorry, I'll get to you, Tommy, that big donors may have constraints in their own accountability, but to John's mind, that doesn't preclude compassion and accompaniment unless the donor organization itself has trauma it's passing on. Really important. The, the chat has so many great comments. Please um, look in there. Tommy. Uh, I just want to applaud. Well, Gemma kind of flipped the script to be like, is it right that our various compliance needs make these things difficult, which I think is a really important point for anybody that's a philanthropic funding body on this call to like take into account how your organization can adjust to provide more flexible funding because I think oftentimes we're putting these burdens on ourselves unnecessarily as well. And to be honest, like WCN's model of our partner network providing flexible funding has made, I think, my life much easier in terms of reporting and what I'm tracking for each organization's dollar. And the way we do that is to ask them for what their annual financial statements are and annual budgets. And so we do have an idea of how folks are spending their money, but we are trusting them to also decide whether it should go to a certain salary or a certain new project that they want to launch. And I think that that's where we have to move is providing grants that are flexible and not trying to force or micromanage each single penny that's spent. Um, so I would encourage folks as much as possible to do that. And I think Gemma and a lot of us at uh, Synchronicity Earth and WCN and Molly Asili is another group trying to work on this is trying to assess like if we as funders can create a little bit more of a collaborative alliance to call out the uh, funding mechanisms that a multilateral organization like the World Bank or something like that may have historically placed on this philanthropic system, which I think we can try to change, hopefully, uh, by setting an example of what an alternative looks like that's very trust-based and more flexible. Yeah, thanks so much, Tommy. I, I mean, as you know, I agree with I agree with what you're saying there. And I do understand that there are significant barriers to overcome, but it doesn't mean that, you know, we can't try to work towards the, a set of solutions that are more viable and useful for the people on the ground. And yes, we do comply to these certain regulations and everyone has different ones depending on which country you're based in. But there can also be pushback on some of those systems. 
and it may not be successful, but it doesn't mean just because that's the current way of working that we have to stick to that way of working. And I do think things are really changing in the giving sector, which is really hopeful. Um, I know you commented too about the equivalency determination. I think, yeah, that's an easier process than it might seem, which I'm happy to share about separately if you want to chat anytime. Uh, but I think it's important to demonstrate that, yeah, there are many organizations around the world that might not be USA 501c3s, but they still are operating in the same, uh, with the same values and kind of compliance standards. Um, so I would be happy to share how WCN navigates that. If you ever want to chat. So note to self, we should have clearly made this session longer as with others. Um, there's been so much great discussion. We did not get to everything in the chat. Apologies. Um, but I think we've set the stage for some really great initial conversations. As it's mentioned um, in the chat, we do have the Slack channel where hopefully we can continue to have these, thank you, Martha, conversations, because it would be great to keep this conversation going. Um, and as all of our panelists have mentioned, it seems like there are some shifts in the donor community, in the philanthropic community, and hearing from these great local groups about the reality on the ground can only support um, these positive changes. So I just want to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you to our interpreters. This was a dynamic one to, to translate, so, so thank you. And I hope that we all can, can stay in touch. We will be sending out a recap as um, Paula has been doing of like the key points from the session. But again, um, let's keep the conversation going in Slack and elsewhere. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks very much, everybody. That was great. Thanks, everyone. Great comments. Bye, y'all. Bye. This chat is so rich. <laughs>